Adam Jorgensen is one of our senior residents. Uh, he's headed for a career in glaucoma. And uh, keeping uh, that in mind, uh, Adam's topic is risk factors for trabeculectomy failure. That is still your topic, correct? Yes, sir. Oh, good. There we go. Great. <clears throat> All right, thanks. Uh, so I'm talking today about risk factors for trabeculectomy failure, and uh, I have no financial conflicts of interest. I'm glad that I'm following Zach's talk on quality improvement because this is kind of the, the issue that I'm talking about. Um, I like this quote. I came across this years ago when I was reading one of Dr. Gowande's books. Um, but I, I guess research in general has always seemed very daunting to me. And when I read this, it made it seem like something that I could definitely do for the rest of my life, where it, it comes down to counting something, tracking outcomes, uh, writing it down and sharing it with other people, and seeing how you can, how you can use those to get better. And so that's essentially the project that I'm going to talk about, what, what we decided to do. Um, so how this came about, uh, over the course of about a year at the VA, uh, our glaucoma surgeries, it seemed like there were a lot of patients that were getting reoperated on. Um, specifically after trabeculectomies, it seems like their, their bleb was scarring down quickly, their pressure was rising, and a lot, a lot of these patients were needing uh, uh, more surgery or just failing. And so, uh, kind of just talking among the residents, we felt this to be kind of uniformly the case. And so, uh, we, we weren't sure if there were preventable risk factors that could be avoided that were contributing to this problem. Um, fortunately, Eileen Wong had the foresight to kind of construct this QI project about this and recruited myself and uh, Ashley Bernheisel. And so uh, we've kind of been exploring this issue, and our questions have been, what is actually the rate of our trabeculectomy success in VA cases over the course of a year? How does this compare with, with other uh, uh, reported outcomes? And if, if our success rate is lower, what preventable risk factors could be addressed or could at least be thought about um, to try to try to get our outcomes better? And so what we did is reviewed all the cases done in a one-year period. Um, we kind of timed this over an academic year and wanted to make sure that we had some decent follow-up for the most recent patients that we looked at as well. We looked at demographics as well as pre- and post-operative visual acuity pressure and medications. And we defined success uh, as a, a pressure reduction of at least 20% and a final intraocular pressure of at least uh, 18 or lower. And uh, the, reason, the reason we chose that is that there are several other bigger trabeculectomy outcome studies that use that same criteria, so it makes it easier to compare. Um, we reviewed a total of 13 cases, so we didn't have a, a large sample size to draw conclusions from. Um, you know, Salt Lake City VA population, these were white males. Uh, they all had uh, primary open angle glaucoma. 62% of them had combined surgery with, uh, with fake emulsification and 92% were resident performed, the one other case was fellow performed surgery. So we, we got a 16% overall reduction of intraocular pressure. Uh, mean medications, we got down 40%. Um, visual acuity got a little worse, 22% worse after surgery, and this was at a mean duration of 46 <coughs> weeks of follow-up. So our overall success rate based on our criteria was 54% and 15% were a success without ever having need for medications or for any uh, bleb needling after surgery. So comparing this uh, with, with other reported outcomes, at, at one year, based on Kaplan-Meier analysis on a lot of, well, I'll, I'll say three or four larger uh, trabeculectomy studies, they're in the range of about 70, in, in the 70s percent. So this was indeed lower than we would expect for uh, our trabeculectomy outcomes. Looking at the time course of postoperative intraocular pressure, uh, uh, right after surgery, a week after, it went up a little to 18, and then a month after surgery, it was pretty much where it was going to stay, right around 13 and a half or so. 
Um, Seventy-seven percent of our patients underwent laser suture lysis, and uh, the mean number of, of laser suture lysis procedures on patients that had it done was two. Um, the, on average, the first procedure was done at uh, almost two weeks, and uh, these were done up to eight weeks after surgery uh, for patients that had multiple uh, laser suture lyses. So um, I was going to talk some about, uh, there are some risk factors that are commonly reported for trabeculectomy failure um, listed here. And essentially all of these, uh, I don't think we had enough numbers to really assess diabetes, but essentially all of these can be excluded in our VA patient population based on the demographics. And so I wanted to look um, at, at some other, other potential risk factors for failure in our population. And so we, we kind of uh, uh, brainstormed and talked about this. Could it be our, our actual VA population? Um, that is more at risk for failure? Could it be that it's resident performed surgery? Um, or could it have to do with surgery, you know, factors regarding the surgery itself, the mitomycin C concentration or delivery time or method or the timing of, of argon, laser suture uh, argon laser suture lysis? Um, at the end of my discussion, I'll open this up and if anyone has any other ideas for uh, potential things that could be looked at, uh, we'd be all ears. Um, so looking at the VA patient population, uh, I found one study that showed they're, they're, they looked specifically at VA patients undergoing trabeculectomy, and they were actually performed by residents or fellows. And they overall had good outcomes. This was in Houston, so the, the demographics don't exactly match ours in Salt Lake City. Um, but overall, they reported 87% success at 12 months. Their criteria was a little uh, looser than ours. And uh, so they, they demonstrate pretty well that it's not necessarily just the VA patients that, that puts them at greater risk. So the next question, does this have to do with uh, uh, resident or fellow performed surgery? Um, I actually mentioned this last year at, at uh, this talk, but I had looked at, at multiple studies that looked at resident or fellow, uh, sorry, just resident performed trabeculectomy versus attending. And, Four of these didn't really show a difference. One was from the UK, so Dr. Patel, we can put less weight on that one. He's not yeah. in here. <laughs> um, uh, and then a groundbreaking study here from Moran that I'm still in the process of publishing uh, showed that fellow performed surgery is also successful and safe compared to attending performed. So that's that issue. Um, and then things start to get muddier, looking at mitomycin concentration. So there have been a lot of studies that try to identify a very specific uh, time and concentration of mitomycin to give in a trabeculectomy to have the best outcome. And so there's been these, some papers talk about a one-size-fits-all where there's a, a one, one concentration and duration that's best for everybody. And some people advocate a custom-tailored approach based on patients' risk factors for failure. Um, so again, they're looking at a one-size-fits-all versus a custom-tailored approach. <laughs> Everyone's still awake, okay. Um, and then, so there was, there was a recent study, and this was not at all the first of these studies, that was looking at whether or not titrating mitomycin C concentration and duration based on preoperative risk factors led to better outcomes. Um, so they looked at 155 eyes. They're looking at things like degree of inflammation, neovascularization, patient age, and um, you know, almost everything that I listed as, as known preoperative risk factors. Um, they varied their concentration and duration, and their conclusion was that there was really no uh, correlation between success and titration of mitomycin C based on any patient variables. Um, and then uh, there's this other group that came out uh, just this year with a study showing that we, we can't even necessarily know the concentration of mitomycin C that we're getting. Um, this group looked at 60 samples of mitomycin C that they had acquired from various pharmacies and that had been, that had been uh, uh, kind of preserved and prepared different ways. 
and they used high performance liquid chromatography and showed that overall concentration was 12.5% lower than what was expected. And there was a wide range um, going down to almost half of the percent or half of the concentration that they had ordered. Um, looking here at the chart, they kind of this box plot shows different methods of preparation. And you can see that there's a couple of these, like the, the frozen samples and um, maybe the dry powder that, that really tend to be below standard of, of what you'd expect from mitomycin concentration. So in addition to concentration and, and duration of exposure, there's different methods of delivering the mitomycin C. So one method is to inject it into subtenon space uh, at the beginning of surgery. Then after, after taking down the, the conjunctiva, you, you still rinse it out. Or uh, the more traditional method is after creating a pyridomy and dissecting down to bare sclera, you put mitomycin-soaked sponges into that space and leave them for a certain duration of time, then remove them uh, and irrigate it. And I found one paper that looked at these two uh, methods of mitomycin C delivery. Um, so again, it's hard to draw a lot of conclusions from one paper, but this group uh, presented in 2013, they uh, injected in, in 125 and placed a sponge in 57. They had similar ILP reduction, um, but they felt that the sponge group was more likely to, to uh, need more intervention after surgery, uh, have five FU injections or develop a vascularized bleb. Um, uh, you know, these complications were similar between the two groups. And so their conclusion was that the injection technique appeared safer um, compared to the uh, other. Looking at uh, argon laser suture lysis timing, the general thought on this is that uh, the, op <coughs> the earlier is better for laser suture lysis timing. There's been a couple studies that show that really 14 days out from a trabeculectomy, if you have pressure about eight, then that's ideal, that that's gonna ensure that you have enough flow through, through the uh, scleral flap that you're not uh, promoting collagen cross-linking and scarring, but also you're kind of balancing that with the risk of hypotony. And so uh, uh, there have been a few authors that feel that eight is really the goal for 14 days after surgery. And there's been, uh, there's been this and a couple other studies that show better outcomes in patients who have early laser suture lysis compared to late, uh, talking about within the first 10 days to, compared to later. Um, but of course, there has to be contradictions um, in, the, in the glaucoma literature. And a more recent study showed that uh, this group looked at late laser suture lysis compared to early in 75 eyes and 64% had, had procedure done within seven days and had a good decrease in intraocular pressure. But 36% had laser suture lysis late. Um, you know, the third quartile was 69 days. Um, so we're talking several, several weeks down the road and still overall had, a, had an intraocular pressure that decreased from 21.7 to 14.7, indicating that maybe it doesn't have to be early. You can still get a good effect from later. Um, this is from that same study, and this is when they did multiple laser suture lysis procedures, and what they're showing is that the amount of lowering, the, the amount of intraocular pressure lowering with the first, which had been done uh, at a median time of three and a half days, the second at a median time of seven days, and the third at a median time of 240 days, uh, all showed pretty good intraocular pressure lowering. Um, and their conclusion was that there was no correlation between the degree of pressure lowering and the time of laser suture lysis when they considered uh, all the procedures. So looking at these conflicting reports, and this reflects multiple other reports that are out there, I think the ideal timing probably depends on, on actual surgeon factors, scleral flap thickness and suture tightness, degree of post-op inflammation and vascularity, and probably other things. And kind of the conclusion that I drew is it probably depends on, you, you know, it's, it's probably something that each surgeon needs to determine the best plan for themselves because there's not going to be a, a best fit for everybody. Um, my conclusions looking at all this is that there are a lot of risk factors for trabeculectomy failure. I'm sure that I haven't covered nearly all of them here. Um, and that there are a lot of, of 
parts of the surgery that are either based on theory largely or are surgeon specific and the data is very mixed. And so, uh, you know, I, I think in glaucoma surgery it's very difficult to draw conclusions from the literature and, uh, you know, expect very, the same consistent results among, among surgeries. The data is very mixed. I think in our case, further investigation, the first thing could be to look at more patients. 13 is not really enough to really have good numbers to make strong analysis, and so this is kind of just a preliminary glance. Um, but I think we could also look at mitomycin preparation techniques and concentrations of mitomycin obtained at the VA versus at other pharmacies such as here at, at Moran. Um, and again, I'm very open to any other ideas that, that anyone may have. Um, these are my references, and I appreciate, um, again, Dr. Wong and D Dr. Bernheisel as well as Dr. Chaya for their help in, in putting this together. Yeah, Dr. Mamos, please. You know, Adam, whenever you're looking at outcomes in uh, trabeculectomies, especially at the VA, there's another factor, and I don't know how to put this delicately, but it, it's, it's follow-up and compliance. And first of all, the <coughs> other patients aren't as compliant. They, they maybe don't show up for the follow-ups as often. They may not use, maybe don't use the drops. But glaucoma is a field where it's very important that the surgeon does the follow-up and watches the patient carefully and does everything. And the problem with the VA system is sometimes the person who does the surgery maybe doesn't do all the post-ops, and maybe somebody else does the post-ops and are not familiar. Somewhere in there, things can kind of fall through the cracks. Either the patients don't come or the follow-up's not done. And I'm wondering if that has any impact in the success rate. And, and I don't know how to study that, but that may be another factor that's involved in the decreased success rate overall. That's a great point. I totally agree. Dr. Roscoe? So, um, Craig and I have had amylosins as well, and there does seem to be that these trials are failing at a higher rate at the VA. And there is so much variability. And um, to next point, even when you know, with <coughs> patients, I would leave one suture tighter and one suture looser. So then I would know which one to cut postoperatively. So again, that follow-up is missing the VA that could be playing a role. I think looking at the mitomycin preparation there is, is definitely key. I would be very interested in what you find. And just from a post hoc analysis, one other contributing factor, not to say that it's higher in this population, but um, you mentioned age of patients, but also preoperative medications. So if patients were on more medications preoperatively for a longer time period, there have been very good studies to show that that also causes inflammatory cytokine changes that could potentially put them in a higher risk for trad failure. Yeah. So that could be another thing you can add to this. I did very nice work. That. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. And thank you also for your help uh, following up these patients, these post-ops at the VA. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Frederick? Um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't try and figure out what's going on, but do you think that just putting tubes in these people would be more successful in the long run and just get the same result pressure-wise? Well, I, I don't know if it's that simple. I don't know if just putting tubes in, you know, we don't know what those outcomes would be either. So it's something to consider. Maybe we should just try doing a higher proportion of tubes and see if our outcomes end up better. So Adam, I had a question. I appreciate your uh, taking a look at this. I mean, that's the only way we can really learn is to examine our results and try to figure out what we're doing right, what we're going to improve on. I was curious, though, you didn't specify whether or not you, all the residents uh, used the same concentration, did they use the same technique? Um, was that all standard, standardized, or was it variable? It was, yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, but the concentration of mitomycin was always the same, 0.2 milligrams per ml. And the surgical technique is the same every time as well. And I, I could have gone through each you know, the, the exact technique, but it is standardized between And like between the time of mitomycin is that standardized? Uh, that, I'm trying to recall. We injected please. everybody. Oh, that's all, right. We all injected subconscious injection, so it wasn't done with sponges. So that's one thing that we did have as a constant throughout this year, right. is that all these patients received on average either 0 0.2 mLs or 0 0.1 mLs uh, between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 as well. So we're talking about 10 to 20 micrograms. So that's the part that we could control. Um, so there's no, there's really no sponges involved in this. So we didn't have any time duration, per se, for 
we're all given that's right. a set of cards that just allow us to sit there and conceptually. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Chen. Yeah. Um, a couple of comments and a question. So these type of studies are incredibly <coughs> important for a couple of reasons. Um, take cataract surgery, for instance, among trainees. We don't actually have any clue across the country what the benchmark is. Everyone probably assumes they're doing pretty well, but we don't actually know we're working on that. And the other reason that this type of study, particularly the VA, is important as well, is it, it would be you know, not a stretch of the imagination at all to have complaints about patient care in eye departments and then have Congress several degrees uh, away from that say, why are we having residents participate in veterans care if they can't deliver adequate uh, or similar care? So these other two studies that you mentioned were really important because again, both of them found, aside from the visual outcomes uh, in California, but both of them found success rates that were, were quite high, I specifically mentioned comparable to attending. So to the final little bit, at our VA it's interesting, Jason Goldsmith was our chief at the VA, glaucoma surgeon, very conservative, so when Dr. Chaya came in, there, there was a huge number <coughs> of patients that potentially could have had surgery much sooner, and so I don't know if you think that might have a difference in our early failure rate because so many of these were really advanced. I think it's something that Laura alluded to is just the exposure to preoperative medications. I, I feel like that's a real thing and patients have been bathed in BAK for years. Uh, the tissues are much more friable uh, and much more likely to go to scarring, whether it be a tube or a trap. So I think that's something that we should look at. And it's hard to know. We don't take great histories all the time. Patients are on multiple medications. And it's, Cross plans or <coughs> but I would say for the most part, we don't have a lot of patients on preserving free drops at the VA because we're formula. Yeah. Um, so it's very yeah. true. That'd be good one. Thank you. Last quick question, Adam. Sure. The ones, the patients that had visual acuity loss, were they due to do you guys was it visual field progression or was it actually cataract progression? If you were just on the track? Um, I, I didn't look closely at each uh, visual. Uh, acuity course to be able to answer that, sorry. Because if it's due to visual field or glaucoma progression, then that gets back to with Craig and um, Jefferson in terms of these patients going more advanced, perhaps when we're operating more. Yeah. I believe they were, uh, the patients that had the major visual acuity drops were pseudo oh, they were. Okay. All right, thanks.